All right. We are one minute early. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the first session of Beyond Civil Rights. Now, this is a conversation about Black history, Black current affairs, and, and ultimately, it is a conversation about Black destiny. Um, I often use this metaphor that when you go to the doctor for the first time, before you are brought into the examination room, you sat down in the in the um, in the in the um, the foyer or wherever it is the reception area, and they hand you this um, clipboard with a bunch of papers on it, and they want to know what's going on with you, but surprisingly, they want to know what your medical history is as well. And not only that, they want to know what your family's medical history is. And there's, there's a fundamental reason for that. Knowing one's history, and not just one's history, but one's family's history, uh, is predictive. It's instructive. I don't believe that experience is the best teacher. I think that there's some things that people have experienced that you can learn from that you don't have to go through. You don't have to, if you see someone get hit by a bus, you don't have to go out there and find out for yourself that getting hit by a bus is painful. Amen. So we study history because it has present value, not because it's interesting. And even though it is interesting, and we're going to, when we do history, we're going to go into ancient African history. But let, let's talk about the, the impetus of this course. Why are we doing it? Well, you know, in Florida and in, in, in several other southern states, there's this regressive um, push to limit, and in some cases to outright demonize um, the teaching of Black history. I think recently in Florida, the the new legislation was passed in the, in, the, in the most recent legislative session that says you can no longer get a degree from a state school in Black history. And that is quite amazing. How is it that we take one step forward and three backwards? Well, what we're going to discover throughout the course of our conversation is that race relations in this country and many other um, issues that we have engaged in and embarked upon to try to bring about a greater degree of equality for all marginalized people in civilization. What we're going to learn is that that happens in cycles. So the march toward equality is not this steady uh, march up the, the mountain of Freedom Hill but it's up the mountain and down the mountain. It's more like a roller coaster ride, okay? We're gonna see that. I'm gonna show you that, in, 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 a, in a, particularly in session three, we're gonna really go into the fact that um, there, are, there seems to be this 100-year pattern, that every 100 years, we're doing our same works over and over again in the United States of America, particularly as it relates to the issue of race. When I teach a course, and, and I use that word teach, uh, when I facilitate a conversation on a topic, I, I consider myself to be the bus driver. Meaning that we're all in this vehicle together, we're traveling to a destination. The destination is a better understanding of ourselves, of our community. of, But ultimately, this conversation is one that will be uh, approach through a biblical and a spiritual lens. I'm excited to know what God did for, for Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Noah. Uh, I'm interested in knowing what he's doing today. Prophetically, what is the Lord doing in the world today? I see what people are doing in the secular arena, but what is God doing? You know, when Jesus was before, before um, Pilate, 
and Pilate was interrogating him and Pilate said, essentially, do you know who I am? You, you realize that I have the power to say whether you live or die? And up until that point, Jesus had been mute. Yes. Okay, let me see. Okay. There, okay, up until that point, I'm being told that people are trying to get in, so I apologize. Let me get, let these people in. Uh, up until that point, Jesus had been uh, mute before Pilate, and he said, now, wait a minute, you need to understand something. The only power that you have is the power that my Father, which is in heaven, has given you. So what Jesus was kindly letting and respectfully letting Pilate know was that at any point, you don't have power over us. And I realize that, that we have enemies in the world, right? People who don't like black people, people who don't like people of color, people who don't like people from other countries, people who don't like people who are not of their particular political persuasion. But they cannot harm us. They cannot even help us. It is only what our Father in heaven allows them to do. So when we study history, when we look at history, when we look at current affairs, when we have this extensive and exhaustive discussion today in for the next few weeks about beyond civil rights, we're going to look at it through that lens, trying to see the hand of God, trying to discern the purpose, the plan of God for the people of God. And, and I, let me just announce to you that you, uh, wonderful, glorious people, you are the people of God that I'm talking about. And, and it is my privilege to be a, to enter into this conversation with you. So uh, without further ado, um, let's go to the material. I'm going to share my screen. Uh, the, the protocol that we have is you can ask any question at any time. Put your question in the chat room. And periodically, I will go to the chat and I will read the question and we'll discuss it. I do not present myself as an expert, but as a facilitator of a conversation about race, about progress, about God's love for all men, God's unique and specific plan for each individual on planet Earth, but not just individuals, because I think we spend a lot of time talking about individual salvation and, and and necessarily so, but what we need to understand is that God has plans to save families. God has plans to save entire communities, states, and nations. God got a detailed plan to save the world. In other words, we know that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. We love to quote that. We know that God, that Jesus died for the world. And we know that Jesus died for me personally, but we get lost in the in-between. Did, did Jesus have the Brown family in mind? Did Jesus have the Kelly family in mind? Did Jesus have the Clark family in mind? Yes, of course. He is a God of detail. And yes, he had black people in mind, not to the exclusion of anyone else, but he had black people in mind. Because all people, Asian people, black people, people of European descent, they're all his creation and he loves all of us. God so loved the world inclusively. Now let's go to the material. Hopefully I won't have technical difficulties. There it is. Let me see if I can share. Can y'all see that? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Give me one second to get this chat off. And then uh, I'm gonna ask people, um, if, if you see someone, I need one technical advisor they do. Help me with that. If someone else is trying to get into the room and I'm not mindful of that, just let me know. Okay, so what, what you are looking at here, interestingly, is the course outline. You see it? You should mm -hmm. It's titled Beyond Civil Rights. Why? Because now, now, we're ta now we're getting into Black history and Black current affairs. For, for so long a time, uh, we have thought, and by the way, I'm a civil rights attorney. And so when I say we, I, I, I certainly put myself in that, that conversation because I spent three and a half years in law school. And before that, multiple years being a civil rights advocate. But 
I'm going to say something and then we'll go further into this conversation. The, the speech that Dr. King did on the Lincoln Memorial steps in 1963 is often referred to as the I have a dream speech, right? Um, yep. But in the earlier part of that speech, Dr. King said to the masses directing that conversation overall to government officials, we are here to cash a check. America's promise when it ended slavery with the Emancipation Proclamation and then further with the 13th Amendment, which abolished slavery, and then further with the 14th Amendment, which gave us equal rights, equal protection, and further with the 15th Amendment, which said that we had the right to vote no matter where uh, our parents were born and what their state was in terms of whether they were former slaves. And further with the Civil Rights Act of 1866 and the Civil Rights Act of 1875, which most of us never learned in school, what Dr. King said, those were checks, those were promises that were written to Black people, the descendants of former slaves, that you will now be made equal participants in this civilization. And when anyone ever challenges that, you can bring this check to court to cash it, and we will honor it. What Dr. King said, and I want you to go back and look at this, and fact check me not just on this, but on anything that I say today, or throughout the course, what Dr. King said is this. We went to the bank to cash the check, and we were told that there, were no, there was no money in the account, insufficient funds. Insufficient funds. And so we went back again, and they said the same thing, and we came back another time, and they said, listen, if you come back again, we're going to actually charge you some overdraft fees. So metaphorically, the issue is that that sentiment that he was expressing that we thought that if we could get some promises written down on paper, that that would ensure our protection, that that would ensure that everyone would respect us, would not trample upon our rights, that would not give us benefit or burden because of the color of our skin, but just would allow us to rise or fall based upon our own initiative and our own merits. That was a fantasy. That's what Dr. King was saying. That is not often uh, discussed, but if you've got to listen to the entirety of his speech. So now that brings us to the topic, because we have tried this again. The most, uh, in the eight, 1860s was the first time that America embarked upon civil rights, acts and laws. As I said just a moment ago, 1866, 1875. The ones that most of us know about, uh, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, and 1964. Right. So the question is, and we're going to get into this in the course of some of these sessions. If we had civil rights in 1866, why was it necessary roughly 100 years ago, 100 years later, rather, in 1964, to come back and do it again? And the answer that I'm advancing to you right up front is that we keep going in circles. Uh, I don't know if you know the definition of that, that uh, what is his name, Albert Einstein had about insanity. He said that it's doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different expecting result. Expecting different result. So that's why the course is titled uh, um, Beyond Civil Rights. And I'm saying it spiritually because I think what we don't realize, what we've got to realize as people of faith is that the powers that be, that, that have to be un, unrooted and unseated, are in, sit, they sit in heavenly places. And Paul talks about this in his epistle to the, to the church at Ephesus, Ephesians chapter 6, I believe. So it, it's not possible to dislodge a spiritual entity with secular law. That's the whole point. That is why we titled this Beyond Civil Rights. Can you see that now? 
Mm -hmm. That's a big windup. A search for an effective response to a continuing problem of race. Is there anyone here who's in doubt that there's still a problem of race in the United States of America? No, no. So I, I list my, my, I'm the instructor, um, pastor and some rights attorney, just so you know my perspective. Now, do you see this wonderful piece of artwork down here? Mm -hmm. um, I want you to, I, this, we, we're going to start the class conversation. Take a look at that. And what does that look like to you? You can comment someone. Tell me what's that, what that looks like to you. A plantation. A plantation. Yes, possibly. Those people there, um, what, what color do they appear to be to you? Usons. <laughs> Black people. Black people, yes. Uh huh. So then, um, this what I did is you've heard of artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. AI, which everyone is talking about. Um, what I told AI to do for me is generate an old courthouse that's broken down. Okay. And a mass of black people standing on the steps looking frustrated like we went here we thought that the law and i'm talking about the law i'm not talking about any one particular but we thought that laws in general could bring a salvation um but the state of the law is like the state of this building that's the point of this illustration ai generated the in terms of the law's ability to help us, in terms of the law's uh, ability to bring permanent solutions to these deeply entrenched problems that we face. Now we're getting into black history, but this course is also a course that deals with obviously faith, right? Religion, trusting God. And in fact, I cannot stress it enough. Everything that we will discuss is coming from a biblical lens but here they are this is the this is the meaning of this this the artwork here that's us folks that's us looking like well what, what are we gonna do now because we were counting on this to be our protection you follow what i'm saying yeah or if, if i could borrow from amari you feel me Uh, and by the way, is there anyone on this um, course right now who did not get the material? We sent those out and I apologize, um, but we sent this out last night, late last night. You should have received it in your email address. The email address that you provided to us when you signed up is the one that, that we sent it to. Is there anyone that didn't get it? You can tell me, you can unmute yourself and tell me. So I'm not going to, read what's in the introduction because it's a lot of whatever I just said to you. Here's what I do want to do because this is the, what we were going to talk about in the first session. I want to talk about the course objectives. Question, can you click out of the um, uh, yeah. document so, it won't, so we won't see that share button because we can see it's coming. Which, one? Which one? Should click out of the what? Just click in the document. Just click on like you're about to type in it. Just okay. click. Okay, thank you. I did, and it's got it, got it. It. I'm in there. Yes, that's fine. I just couldn't see it. You had the share. It was hiding some you of the. You fixed the problem. You fixed what she was telling I you. I fixed the problem. You can see the whole text now? We can. We can see clearly now. The rain is gone? Okay. All right. Let's talk about the objectives, because that's what's important. Why are we here? What do I hope to achieve in this conversation? Participants will learn the importance of creating and executing group vision and, and a group plan for the group's collective future. I'm telling you this up front, that one of the things that I have learned and come to the conclusion about in my study of human history, uh, race relations, ethnic relations, current affairs, is that we either rise or fall as a group. That's there's not going to be one of you that escape and, and manage to have a happy life apart from the group. We are judged 
and averaged by the worst of us and the best of us. What my particular insight that I, I believe the Lord has, has, has given to me that I'm going to share with you throughout is that God has a plan. He has a plan for all people. And yes, that is individual. And yes, that is global, but also it is collective. It is regional, it is state-based, it is family-based. So we are, and, and I'll get into that in, in, in later sessions, we are having a group experience. So if we're having a group experience, then there needs to be a group plan. That is one of the messages that I'm yelling and screaming out the gate. Civil rights laws, I'm sorry. I'm a civil rights attorney. I went and checked on that bank account this morning before I started the class. It's still in the same status that it was when Dr. King was talking about it in 1963. And I'm talking about the state of the law in, as it relates to its power to deliver us from spiritual wickedness in high places in the, in the sense that the Apostle Paul talks about it in his, his conversation in, in Romans, rather in, in Ephesians. Participants will understand the cyclical nature of racism and discrimination in the United States. I've already been discussing that, right? Participants will learn the idea of permanence within the political context and the legal context is illusory. Illusory is a big word. And does anyone know what that means when I say illusory? Other than Brooke. Oh man, I was just about to. Okay, Brooke, go ahead and tell us what it means. So illusory, I mean, the key word is illusion. So it's not real. It appears to be one thing, but in fact, it's not. Right. So. In the context of civil rights, and this again, the course is beyond civil rights. We said, we got our laws, we got our protection. It's our wall of safety. Now we can celebrate. Now we can work on getting a holiday for our, our heroes. Okay. We thought we had the problem solved, but it was an illusion. Session one talks about the fact that when it comes to men, the only thing that is permanent is change. I mean, think about Rome. You remember the great Roman Empire? How great is Rome today? Rome has been reduced to a city, literally. Mm -hmm. Great Britain, how great is Britain today? So why is all that important? Whatever plan we have going forward, we have to plan with the understanding that there's always going to be constant change. There's always going to be moving parts. It's going to always be a need for us to be sober and vigilant because the enemy, who's our enemy? The man? Well, the man, whoever that might be, is, a, is an instrument and a vessel of the enemy, but the enemy is the devil. The enemy is the spiritual rulers that sit in high places that have been assigned to oppress us, to, to engender and to create an oppressive uh, set of circumstances uh, for black men and for other uh, people of color. There are different instruments and different agents that Satan uses, but let's make, make, let's be clear about this. We're in a spiritual battle. It has political implications and ramifications, but we are in a political, rather a spiritual battle. And, and so therefore you, you can't permanently constrain spiritual forces by the passage of secular laws, but we keep trying. And one of the metaphors that I use in, in the outline, and I encourage you to read it after the class, before class, next time, is that passing laws and thinking that that creates permanence is like building a beautiful uh, sandcastle on the beach. Anyone ever seen an a, a exquisite sandcastle? And you know what about sandcastles? about every single sandcastle, you know what happens? Terry, you're talking, I don't, you can water tear down. They get washed away. Who said that? Paul. Paul. Yeah, Paul. I like Paul's response. Everyone else's response was great, but I like what Paul said. Because no one has to come and kick the castle down, right? Just nature itself the waves come right the wind come the birds come and 
the castle sand is reclaimed by the environment. And, and I'm stressing the fact that this notion of permanence, that's the first step that I, uh, I won't say, it's not an error, but it's a miscalculation that we made as a group. We thought, we thought that if we got to a certain point, that that point was going to be permanent, but it's illusory. So permanence is illusory in the context of human discourse. Let me go on to other things that we will learn. Participants will be able to identify the corporate and big money donors that fund front groups opposing civil rights laws. Now, as I said to you, we know that our problem in its origin is spiritual, but there are many agents on planet Earth. Some of them are corporate donors or who want to keep confusion and contention among the average Joe and Jane of different colors and of different ethnic origins and different religious faiths. At the end of the day, what, what, what was slavery about? Tell me what was the bottom line um, motivation for enslaving Black people in America? Someone, anyone. Money. Money. It's about money. Guess, money. And guess what? Any form of, if you go to the bottom layer and you pull every curtain down and you get to the core, guess what current oppression is about? Money. Money. But today, those who are doing it are puppeteers. They're very clever. They, they put front groups out and they give them very patriotic sounding names like Americans for Progress. But in reality, they're funded by big donors who want to keep us distracted. This is Jerry Gurley's idea. This is, I'm going to show it to you though, in, in the material that I present to you. And again, I'm a facilitator. Uh, I want you to go investigate. All right. And then we'll talk more in further sessions. Let me go on. Participants will learn the history of the human migration and how it has affected the development of civilization over time. One of the things that we're going to get into is some science and some geography. We're going to talk about the Malakovich. Uh, cycles. I, I know you're probably wondering, what does that have to do with Black history? Well, first of all, when we did our um, Africa's contribution to the Bible, we talked about the fact, and that's a previous course that we did two years ago during the, during the pandemic, we talked about the fact that, that anthropologists, genetic scientists, and, our, and um, what, sociologists, they all agree that humanity origin, place of origin is on the east coast of Africa in what is called the Great, Great Rift Valley. Modern day Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, Rwanda, that's where humanity started. Started, the key word is started. But then humanity began to migrate northward and eastward in search of food and, and, and acceptable living conditions. One of the things that we're going to learn in, in future sessions is that the Sahara Desert, which I'm sure everyone has heard of, right? That the yeah. largest hot desert, because there are cold deserts also, hot desert on planet Earth, the Sahara Desert, which is in the northern part of the continent of Africa, roughly the size of the United States of America, by the way, that desert, if you can put your mind around that, was once an oasis with rivers and streams and lakes. And people lived there comfortably. And they had all of their needs met. How do we know that? Because scientists have found rock paintings showing uh, zebras and lions and people who identified themselves and depicted themselves as black in right in the middle of the Sahara Desert in caves. So what we will learn in, in future conversations is that at some point, obviously, the Sahara Desert dried up. And we'll talk about the science of how that happened. But philosophically and metaphorically, what we will take from that, hopefully, is this, that sometimes we're in situations and, and, and the climate is such that it is so inhospitable 
that we have to migrate, we have to move. And that's one of the strategies that we will discuss, especially toward the end. Now, this course is divided into three sections. Each section has three sessions. In the third section, we will discuss extensively where do we go from here. As I said, this course is about Black history. It's about Black current affairs. But most importantly, it is about Black destiny. I think the thing that God has really been speaking to me about is I, I, I don't want my people to be worried and frustrated and thinking that, that this is going to go on and on and on and on forever. I don't want them to think that they're forsaken by me, that I'm trying to meet, we're meeting in heaven right now and trying to work out this crisis, this resurgence of racism and of racial intolerance of dismissing black history and black contribution and diversity and inclusion, all of that. I don't, God does not want us to be worried about any of that because God has a plan and it wasn't a plan that he initiated uh, when certain people got into office. Well, God's plan, was put in place before the foundation of the world was laid. Do you know that that black people in the United States of America are approaching 50 million in, in total? 50 million? We're at 48 million right now. Well, that's quite remarkable because when the first black people came to the United States on that Dutch ship as indentured servants, they weren't even slaves. There was like 25 of them, okay? 25. Now, one of the things that I've, I'm saying this prophetically now, because part of the teaching that God has assigned me to do, and I'm going to be faithful to the best of my ability to do it, uh, is is this, and I'm, I'm sorry, I was looking at something in the chat. Part of the teaching that God has assigned Jerry Gurley to do, and, I, and I, I'm going to do it without a reservation from this point forward is telling us what he's doing now. You know, often in the religious setting, we talk about what God did for Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. We talk about the fact that in the future, the dead in Christ will rise when that final trump sounds. And, and that is so exciting. I want to be in the number when the saints go marching in. But there's this gap as though God is on vacation, that God is disengaged. And this is the thing that God is telling me specifically to talk about. I'm, I'm at work in the gap. I'm at work in the Middle East right now. I'm at work in Asia. I'm at work in Europe. I know about Russia and, and Ukraine. I know about uh, Palestine and, and Israel and, and Hamas. I'm at work. I'm at work in the United States. I know about the fact that this country is, is tearing itself apart on, on the basis of political ideology, on the basis of race, on the basis of so many other things that are artificial, that are self-made. But I am building up you people. So this is my prophetic word to you. This is why I'm here on a Saturday morning. This is why I'm excited that you are with me this morning because God, I have a word for you from the Lord. I'd like to to, to hide and, and, and act as though I'm an academic, but actually I'm not. I'm a student of the word, but I'm not an expert of the word, but I am a, I'm a hearer of the word. And God has a word for you and me and all of us collectively. You don't get 24 people multiplied into 50 million people unless I'm at work. And that's the word of the Lord. Amen. Now Amen. let me put that, in, that 50 million in context, there are 200 and I think 45, more or less, uh, nations, sovereign nations that are recognized by the United Nations. And again, don't, don't, it's, you can fact check me, but it's in excess of 200 and I know, I'm pretty sure it's in excess of 240. But of those nations, the average nation is somewhere around 35 million or less in terms of total population. So then in fact, if we were a nation, black people just in our numbers, close uh, to 50 million, if we were a nation, we would be in the top 30. 
of all the nations in the world. Why is that important? Because when we try to figure out why we keep having issues of race in this country, one perspective that we need to have is that in effect, we are a nation existing within a nation. 50 million people, no, we're not a monolith. Okay, I, and we get into that conversation too. We're not monolithic, but yet we are common in many ways. We are having a common experience. And we're, whether we know it or not, we're, ha we're, we're, we're receiving common treatment. Let me give you an example and I'll move on. And I'm just talking about the objectives. The purpose of this session is to whet your appetite, to give you um, an introduction to in terms of what to expect. And maybe we will get to our our conversation about intergenerational erosion, which goes to the thing that there's nothing permanent. So whatever we build today, we pray and we hope that we find a way to pass that on to our children tomorrow. But we don't. We have to do more than hope. We have to plan for it. And what we need to understand, what this civil rights attorney is telling you and this minister is that that will not be achieved by getting new laws passed, because that's Albert Einstein definition. We've got to go to the cross. We've got to turn to each other. This is the message of the Lord. God's got a plan. We've got to find out what that plan is and get about that. Again, God has a purpose for his being here. We weren't brought here from Africa. Our descendants weren't brought here from Africa to punish us. No, this is something that God said to me at least 10 years ago. I planted you like a tree by the rivers of water and the evidence is that you went from 24 to 50 million and you're still growing if god is punishing you don't grow you don't expand you you de you decrease and and i'm not saying only black people because that that's that you you got to hear this this is a conversation about black history black current affairs and black destiny so yes i'm speaking to this population and i'm telling you what i hear very clearly from the Lord. I know that was a long elaboration. Uh, participants will learn, now I'm back to reading the objectives, will learn the history of human migration. I just went on to that. Participants will learn about the mass migration of black people out of the South in 1910. How many of you heard about the, what is called the, the Great Migration? Uh -huh. Yes. Right. And. I think all of us on here have family members uh, who went to New York, right? Lynn, right? Um, went to California, right, Terry? Yeah. Um, went to yes. Chicago, went to New Jersey. Why? Because when black people, uh, and all people for that matter, just throughout history, when they're in a place, remember I talked about the, uh, the, the Sahara Desert? Remember that? Yeah. And you're like, well, how would that possibly tie in? When the conditions where I'm currently living become so unbearable, intolerable, and inhospitable, what human beings have done throughout recorded history is they move. Yeah. You understand? Mm -hmm. so, sure do. so the revelation, here's the great revelation for black power, black empowerment, black strength, black recovery is and I'm telling you, I'm giving you a preview of session four. And by the way, you have the material. You are permitted to read ahead. You're permitted to come to class with questions to ask this, the instructor. I strongly encourage that because that will promote a different kind not, of- Not not Brooke Gurley though. She can't ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> whatever, whatever we got to do, we got to do it together. You hear me? Amen. <laughs> in the words of that Reverend Amari, you feel me? <laughs> you gotta do it to together. You. My destiny is tied to your destiny. Your destiny is tied to my destiny. It's a family thing. It's a group yeah. thing. Black people left the South beginning in 1910 in great numbers. It's called the Great Migration. A total of 6 million Black people left the South. And for a good reason. But here's another preview statement I'm going to put out there. I'm going to put it out there. Y'all ready for it? Yes, sir. I'm ready. 
Here's the preview. There, there was a there was a um, man named Moses who killed a, an Egyptian and then he ran off to uh, the, the Arabian desert. You all read that? Yeah. Yes. And there came a time when God uh, uh, appeared to him in the burning bush and and he wanted to talk to him about Egypt. And what did he tell him in effect? It's time to go back. Go back. There was a man named Joseph. He was married to a woman who was a virgin. Her name was Mary. There was a crazy king out there at that time, about the time when she was about to give birth uh, to her son. We may know him as Jesus, Yahshua, Hamashiach. An angel appeared to Joseph in the dream. And what did he tell Joseph initially? Time to go back. No, no. Before that, where, what did he tell him, though? Scholars, biblical scholars. What was the first message that Joseph received from the angels? Don't you need to take Mary for your wife. And and yes, Minister Paul, you are your own point. But here for time. And he sake, said, leave because this crazy man is trying to kill y'all, kill the babies. Y'all remember that? Yes. Yeah. He yeah. told him to leave. And where did he go, by the way? To what, Egypt. Bethlehem. To Egypt. To Egypt. Egypt. Which also yeah, happens exactly. to be folks in Africa, just so in case you don't know ge geography. <laughs> you say the Middle East. No, Egypt is in Africa. Okay, but I I digress. That's another conversation. Uh but Minister Brown, Pastor Phil Moore, did, yes, did there come a time when there was further instructions from, from the angel concerning where Joseph being in, in Mary and Jesus being in Egypt? Yes. And what, what were those instructions? Uh, he, he told him that uh, the king Herod had had died, and and it was safe to go back. All right, there you go. Boom. Sometimes the plan of God involves us going back to the scene of the crime. Mm. Mm -mm, mm -mm. Mm. The great migration. We ran out for a good reason. Mm. You know, when black people hear the word, the name Mississippi, what comes to your mind? Mississippi burning. Mississippi burning. Exactly what I was going to say. What, Hang, go ahead. No, lynch, go ahead. No, lynching. No. Huh? Lynching. Lynchings. Well, let me ask this question. Does, does, does good things, positive things come to you? Most black people mind? Absolutely not. the name black um, Mississippi? No. no. Keep, keep driving. That's what comes to mind. <laughs> yeah, like, don't, don't stop. Don't get caught there at nighttime. <laughs> but do you know that Mississippi is actually a beautiful state? Yeah, that's, that's what I was going to say. It's actually beautiful. But but most Black people in California that I grew up, you know, Mississippi is like there's hell and then there's Mississippi. <laughs> <laughs> Green. Do you know yeah. why Mississippi has that reputation among Black people? Because, it's because of the lynchings. Because, and you know why there was so much uh, racial oppression and, and physical violence? And terrorism really perpetrated against because there's a lot of black people there. It's, it was sure numbers. If the if the majority principle, majority governance principle was allowed to work in Mississippi, you would have had and you would have today if black people hadn't left, black governors, black US senators, black congressmen, black mayors. And the devil is always trying to run us off of our God given. Hmm place divide and conquer where god has planted us i'm giving you some previews in terms of the plan is one of collective strategic group movement that's the plan that's what has always helped human beings throughout time. nothing else has worked you know, lastly, I'm going to give you one other illustration about why migration, why group movement is important, why group destiny is important, why it's important for us to get in our minds once and for all that we are tied to each other by divine assignment. Is it Joseph started out being right? He started out being the second in charge only under Pharaoh in Egypt, right? Mm -hmm. 
But there came a time that his descendants and his brother's descendants were slaves in Egypt for 400 years because a Pharaoh came along that didn't know Joseph. And that's the right. changing that we talked about. The, this permanence, that's, that's an illusion. One way that God prevents a, uh, what we would call in political terminology, a discrete minority, which black people are. Uh, by the way, what's the percentage of black people in this country compared to the overall population? Brooke, don't answer what, 14 percent? 14 percent. And you're right. You're right on point, Mr. Minister Brown. 14 percent. You, We are a minority. And when you are a minority, but yet distinct, you are always historically, and this is, if you go back to the, 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 the law of Moses, uh, minorities were referred to as either strangers or aliens. If you're a stranger or you're an alien, you are always in danger of being oppressed. That is why God addressed that out the gate with Israel. But let me get back to Israel, because I have one more point of why group movement is the future of Black power in this country. And that's why I'm saying Black destiny. That's why I say this course is about Black history, Black current affairs, and Black destiny. Now, so there came a time that uh, a Pharaoh came who didn't know Joseph, right? We all know that. All mm -hmm. of them are biblical scholars. So what was the remedy? to raise another pharaoh and pass some new laws and say, from this point forward, all people will be treated equal in Egypt. No. No one will be judged by the color of their skin or by their religious preferences. Is that what happened? No. no. He said, we need to oppress these people because there's too many of them. So what was God's remedy for that? Exit stage left. Exit. Look. Uh, human behavior is consistent and when you are the uh, when you are the identified minority uh as long as a, there is a friendly administration in place you're going to be all right but when the new pharaoh comes whoever that is when the new administration whoever that is comes you're back in jeopardy and we should see that right now mm -hmm. that's what's being played out right now in america with respect to black race with respect to us as a people, because we, we we put our trust and confidence in the wrong thing. We can't trust, right. we can't trust man. We can't trust political parties. They exist not to advance uh, principle, that, but power. Yeah. So we're having a group experience. I'm telling you up front that group migration has always been humanity's response. Do you know? that some of the people that were in the Sahara Desert actually went to the west coast of Africa and they formed great empires like Ghana and Mali and Songhai or Songjai, I'm not sure. Do you know that some of those people who left the Sahara Desert because it dried up went to the Nile River and formed an empire called Egypt and Kush and Kemet? See, sometimes God is allowing the heat Sometimes God is allowing the creek to dry up so that he can push you to your next destination. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes. Like the disciples. Right. Yeah, Persecution was caused so that the gospel would spread. Yeah. And we can go back to Elijah who, got, who was hiding out by the, 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 the brook of Cherith. Mm. He was drinking water. And the ravens, I think it was the ravens, were bringing him flesh twice a day. Right. Mm -hmm. He had everything he needed until the creek dried up. And when I look around as a, as a civil rights lawyer and as a minister of the gospel and as a black man in America and as just a human being, I see the creek drying up on us again. We can just say, God, God, bless the creek. Lord, cause the rain to fall in the name of Jesus. I claim it. I claim it. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Or we can just move. God said something to me about this. And then now we're going to go to the last part. Of, I mean, we're going to get to it because um, I got a lot more uh, objectives. Now, I'm, I'm not going to finish all the objectives. I'm going to let you read it. That's why I gave you the outline. But I'm going to say this to you. 
when I was studying that 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 passage in in um, in, in a, about Isaac, about Elijah in the crook in, in the creek or you know, the brook drying up, this is what God said to me. You know, you can pray and ask me to move. You can fast. You can stand fast. You can hold fast. You can believe all you want. But it's hard to get me to move when I'm trying to move you. Mm. So here's the real question that I'm posing in this class to you scholars. Is it possible that God is trying to move us? And that's mm. why the heat is turning up. And he's trying to tell us that this and your confidence is in the wrong place. Yes. Mm. All right. Mm. Let's talk about intergenerational erosion. And these are what I call girlyisms, which means I made these terms up to describe okay. what is happening or a phenomenon that so it is what it says. From one generation to the next, the baton hits the ground. Mm. We're not sh transferring our faith, not just in our community, but in our community. In America, for the first time, there's, there's an organization called Pew, and it, it does all kinds of poll testing and surveys. And for the first time in, in the history of testing, church attendance is below 50% in America. That, that, that happened in 2021. Europe, which at, in 1917 was, was the global base for Christianity, is now essentially a post-Christian continent. Did you know that? Um, what's exciting, though, is this. That, and, and again, you got to fact check me or, or this conversation doesn't mean anything at all. So I'm inviting you to fact check me. Is that the current base, the current continent that has the most Christians, almost a billion, actually there's a, a billion people on the continent of Africa and 600 million of them are Christians. The current global base of Christianity is Africa. Wow. That makes sense if God is doing a great thing, if God is doing a big thing, if things happen in circles. You see, because actually if the great, if the, if the beginning of humanity was Africa, then that's where God began to interact with uh, humanity. That's where they first learned that there was a God and what God's expectations were. And then we drifted because that's also the story of humanity, right? To drift to go astray. We call that sin, to miss the mark. But things are coming back around. And one of the things that I'm going to advance to you in, in future sessions is that God, one of the reasons why we're here on planet Earth is that God wants to use us to spark a spiritual renewal right here on this, this soil that we that we're standing on. I'm going to show you, and in fact, you can read ahead, please. I, I don't feel threatened. Empirically, objectively, of all the ethnic groups that are in the United States of America, Black people go to church more than everybody else. We are steadfastly uh, believers in the Bible more than other people. Now, again, there's two organizations that, point, that have done research to show this. There's the PRRI, and that is a Christian-based organization. The PRRI, you can look up. And then, of course, there's P P E W. But the stats are somewhere in this in your outline that you have. And in addition to the stats, I provided links because I, I the way that I learn, and you know, and because I grew, I I when I was obtaining my master's degree in public policy, it was always about say something and then cite the source. And so I'm not just saying this, I'm telling you, you go find out for yourself, but it's true. God is at work in our community. 
That's the point. Why are we under attack? Because there is a plan that God has for us that we ourselves are ignorant about. The enemy is coming at us because he understands that there's greatness that resides within us, not just us. I'm not saying, so we're special that we're elevated. I'm saying God wants to use, you know, why did God choose Israel? Because they were the least, right? Not the greatest, but the least. But God has a, an exciting thing that he's trying to do in us and through us. But we got to get on board. We got to realize this ain't about what the man is trying to do. This ain't what about the devil is trying to do. The, the, the relevant question at all times is what is God trying to do? What is he doing now? But our thing is this, intergenerational erosion, and I'm not going to go to any of the links today because I think we're coming up on the time um, at 1055. But intergenerational erosion is the failure of one generation to pass on its values, its priorities to the next. And the first and the last civil rights movement figuratively speaking, in the black power movement that we need to embark upon is to empower our children and our grandchildren and our great grandchildren with faith and devotion to the Lord. Oh, well, at least you asked them. That's, that's, the, that's the message that I'm screaming out the gate. And salvation is not in the law because what the law is, and now I'm, now I'm speaking as a lawyer, what the law is, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is the present generation's statement of what is important. The present generation's statement of what is important. Not the future. And getting the present values, even though they're written down, transferred to the future majority, does not happen automatically. It happens with intentionality planning and determination we have to at a minimum come to understand what god's plan is for us and we have to at a minimum begin to transfer our spiritual faith in god our commitment to god and listen we can't do anything for god in terms of we put money in the offering plate that's great uh, but we can do something for god's people You've heard me say, some of you that know me recently, your friends, those are people that you choose, your family, that's God's assignment to you. God assigns you your family. And so we've got to get into the mindset that we've got to build black, the black community up one family at a time. Amen. Not just the nuclear family, me, my four, and no more, but the extended family. Now, one of the tragic things that happened in the Great Migration when six, black, six million Black people left you, the South is that the families were fractured. You know, I often tell my wife, um, who grew up in Florida, going to Apopka, seeing her grandma Nim, I feel jealous. Because my grandma and them was in Arkansas, and I saw my grandma and them probably four or five times in my entire life. I had maybe two conversations with my grandmother, my father's mother, zero conversations with my father's father, more conversations with my mother's mother. We were a family, but we didn't know each other and we weren't there to love and support each other and back each other up. And that's what oppression does. And we are still in that fractured state and any healing and any empowerment begins with mending the family so that we can be together, think together, support each other and pass on our values so that going forward, there's no more of this intergenerational erosion within the community there will always be outside of the community don't put your trust in the law don't put your trust in who's in office currently because that's a passing thing that's a moving target amen 
hopefully I've in wet I've, I've wet your appetite just a little bit to to dive in. The the outline has hyperlinks in it so that you can click on the material and study ahead. We provided you with the workbook um, for session one. There was really only one term that I definition at the end of each session. Um, there's a you can see I cited to the Pew study and you if you click on that link, it'll take you to the Pew's research site and there's if you want to know more about that that information I talked about the black people, the black church, the that the number one continent that has the most Christians in it is uh, Africa. Um, click on the link go there. Now I'm going to read the actual definition that I put in the outline. When one generation embraces less of the values and adopts few of the ideas of its predecessor, we refer to this as intergenerational erosion. Session one, you can write notes, thoughts, and impressions. Uh, you can um, have questions that you want to ask next time around. Uh, I don't see any comments or statements in the chat. Um, here's the session. Um, pardon? Someone asked a question. Okay. I want to ask a question. Yes. Wait a minute, are we over? Can we ask questions now? You can ask questions. My I lecture is over. It. Listen, my lecture for today is over because I'm going to respect your time. But the way that this is going to go beyond my lecture, I'll be here. Anyone that wants to hang around and ask questions, you can do that. I invite that. So I'll stay as long as there's people there that want to ask questions. So what's your question, Terry? I want, can you um, go back? I was writing them down, the amendment things, what they said, the you mentioned the 13, 14, and 15. Can you, do you mind going back and telling me what each one of them said? Sure. All right. So let's go back because this is the conversation about Dr. King saying, yeah, uh -huh. comparing those to checks, right? Promise yes. to pay. So it starts. Well, first with, of all, I shouldn't go to the bank today. Yeah. <laughs> it starts with the Emancipation Proclamation that freed the slaves in, of the states that were in rebellion. So it didn't even free the slaves of the states that were not in the rebellion. So it was a nice piece of paper, but it didn't free all the slaves. So it was half done. Okay, sure. And okay. so the Southern states said, well, we don't recognize that. And then there was the end of the Civil War and the Southern states laws and the Republicans at that time who were the liberals, it's kind of flipped now, right? But the Republicans was the party of Abraham Lincoln. But at that time, the Democrats were pro-slavery and the Republicans were pro-freedom. So the Republicans were controlling Congress and they said, we're going to put some stuff in the Constitution because Constitution is the highest law of the land. And if it's in the Constitution, we know for sure that everyone's going to respect it. So the first constitutional amendment that was put up was the 13th Amendment, which abolished slavery or okay. forced servitude. That's what, but there was in the 13th Amendment what is called a parenthetical clause. That's a little side door. It said slavery is over in the United States with one exception. If you've been convicted of a crime, you can be forced to serve without payment. And guess what Southern states started to do? Put they people in jail. A little crack and they turned it into the Grand Canyon. And they started creating all of these bogus laws that are called vagrancy laws. Um, if you were a black man and you could not show that you were gainfully employed by a white man, you could be arrested and charged with $50. That's the fine. If you couldn't pay the fine, you had to go to jail for six months. And if a white man came and paid your fine, then you would have to work for him for six months. So guess what? Black people found themselves right back in slavery. And your former master had the first shot at paying your, your fine. So the 13th Amendment left the back door open and they went in there and they worked the back door through that, what I call the parenthetical clause. The 14th Amendment said, look, because then the white Southern states said, look, well, even if you are free, it doesn't make you uh, a citizen and you don't have a right to vote. You have to be a citizen of the state of 
of Alabama, of Mississippi, of South Carolina, North Carolina, Florida. And so they passed the 14th Amendment and said, look, it doesn't matter whether your, 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 your ancestors were slaves. Everyone is a citizen of the United States. Everyone's entitled to equal protection under the Constitution of the United States. Everyone is equal. So that's where equality, the notion of equality, uh, began to be discussed in earnest in the United States of America. So then the Southern states said, everyone is equal. But when you come to vote, you've got to be able to pass a literacy test. And if you can't read, then you can't vote. But if your grandma can read, then we will allow you to vote anyway. You've heard the term being grandfathered in. Uh huh. That is where that comes from. So we were ready to celebrate when the emancipation, and then we said, oh, wait a minute. Then now we got the 13th Amendment, and we said, for sure, we got our rights, and oh, no, wait a minute. Then we had the 14th Amendment. Oh, no, wait a minute. Then we had the 15th Amendment, which said, you cannot use these devices to keep Black people from voting. They shall be allowed to vote. But then they continued. They said, well, everyone has to pay a poll tax. And so we come all the way, we, we go from the 15th Amendment to the Civil Rights Act of 1866, which is very much like in substance the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And then we have the Voting Rights Act of 1965 that further deals with poll taxes, grandfather taxes. You get, can you count the amount of jelly beans in the jar? Literally, Black people would go to the voting office and they would have a, a jar of jelly beans on the counter and say, this is testing your intellectual functioning. How many jelly beans? Oh, you missed it. You can't vote today. All kinds of nonsense. The voting oh my goodness. dealt with that. That's horrible. Well, what you should understand <laughs> is currently in Florida and in Alabama, Alabama, there is an intentional act to try to erode, to try to strike down the Voting Rights Act of 65, 1965, that dealt with the jelly bean and the grandfathering and the poll tax. Currently, there's there, there are efforts in the federal court system right now to try to strike down, but it shouldn't be a surprise to you because what I said to you up front is that there is a cyclical nature to race relations in this country. Yeah. And so we, you know, in, in, the, in the 60s, there was a famous song uh, by a group called the Men of Distinction. Anybody know what that song was? It's applicable to, to, to this conversation today, to your questions. Mm -hmm. I know the song is another group, I'm sure. I'll sing, I'll sing a little bit of it. You got me going. In circles, yeah. Uh, round up, uh, round up. Uh, 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 oh, 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 round, uh, round uh, I go. You got I'm gonna have to download that now. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Going in circles. Capisha, we're going that. in circles. And and that's insane. If, if if the prophet Albert Einstein could speak to that, that's insane. But here's the good news. We don't have to reach outside. Here's the prophetic word to this group. We don't have to reach outside of this group to begin to address that. We've got to look inside. We got to look inside of ourselves. We got to repair our families. Mm -hmm. We, we can't run from God. We've got to turn to him as never before. He's doing his part. Even though we don't understand, we don't appreciate, he's growing us up. Mm -hmm. He's doing it. He's planted us by the river. Uh, by now, many people would have withered. You know, when the Native Americans came into contact with uh, the Europeans, a lot of them died because of the smallpox and syphilis that these diseases that they brought from Europe that they just the Native Americans couldn't handle it. You know, mm -hmm. we're out there in the cotton field, you know, <laughs> that's all y'all got, you know, and, and that because God had a different plan for us. God didn't send us here to punish us. He, he, he positioned us for power and for production to come. And at the end of the day, when we try to figure out this insanity, why do we keep having these same racial conversations, understand that that starts at a spiritual level. 
because Satan has some awareness. He's not all knowing, but he has some awareness of who we are. And guess what? He's playing on the fact that we are ignorant about yeah. what God has. And we have not, we've sought deliverance and guidance and direction in every place, but where we should have sought it. And God is saying, come, come, because I, I, I'm not trying to figure it out. I got a plan. All right. Appreciate your question, Terry. Any other questions? Yeah, I have one. Yes. When you made the statement that black people go to church more than any other group, I think here in the States, is that percentage wise or is that numeric? Well, it can't be numeric if we're only 14%. That, that's why I was trying to make sure it was it clarified. Is, it is, okay. It's percentage wise. And let me do this test. Black people are more spiritual than other people. Now, wait a minute. You're like, no, I'm not prejudiced. Let me define what I mean when I say spiritual. We are more mystical. We believe in dreams more than other people. Let me come at it that way. Is, is there anyone here who doesn't think when I have a dream that it might, it might be an indication that God is saying something to me or trying to get a message across to me? Oh, I know it is. All right, y'all ready for the test? I got one test. This is a pass or fail test. I want everyone <laughs> to answer this question. When a person dreams about fish, Somebody's not pregnant. Somebody pregnant. Where did you learn that? Where did you learn that? All I know is it ain't me. Who told you that? <laughs> Big Mama. You didn't learn that at, in, in any of your classes at school? Big Mama passed that down. Well, do you know that that actually comes all the way from Africa? That that's what they were teaching people in Africa? The wow. forced labor? Hey, Tim, what about the sign of a snake? Yeah, that's If you dream about a snake. You, you don't you dream, you, well the okay. devil is depicted as the great serpent in the bible right so i mean you don't want to be dreaming about no snake yeah because it means it's an enemy that's what we was taught if you dream right. i dreamed i was in a thing with a bunch of surrounded by a bunch of snakes that means i'm surrounded by i'm people saying that but if you speak to, if you speak to charlie uh, and charlie uh, who's not uh, black had a dream about fish he's like hmm i think i'm gonna go to red lobster today and have some fish <laughs> right so there's seafood lovers and you. I'm saying that there's a spiritual aspect to what we do. Mm -hmm. We operate in this realm. Let me give you another example. And I've been talking to my family about this. And this is for some of you who are more seasoned. That the music that we call R&B, rhythm and blues, mm -hmm. in the 60s and 70s, what was that music called? Soul, soul music. Soul, 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 soul music. Someone says soul food. Somebody hungry. That was me. Soul, soul train. food. Yeah. Uh uh. It is, but it was you. Whoever said that? That's true because music is food for the soul. Music prepared by the soul. You know, people who refer to that music as soul music were not black people, but it was outside observers uh white people largely they could not understand why they could relate to it you know the, you go to a blues club today there's a lot of white people there sometimes more than black people mm -hmm. because the music that we brought with us from africa and the music that we engage in even in our church settings comes from a different place not a better place but a soulful place so when i talk about being spiritual minister brown and Minister Brown and Minister Fillmore, Minister Fillmore. I'm talking about we do it at a different in a different way, and that also happens to be a part of the fact that you know, uh, post uh, or prior to our American experience, we were pre-literary. You know, so if you don't read, you can't read music, right? Right. So right. when you compose when you comprise music or when you compose music, it has to come from a different place. Yes. So we dig in here and we bring the totality of our experiences, and it's called soul music. We are soulful people. I'm just trying to say we got to if we want to talk about group progress, we got to know ourselves first. That doesn't make us better than anyone. That makes us we have a different approach. But that different approach is thousands of years old. I gave you a quick test. You all pass. You dream about fish. Someone's pregnant. <laughs> Period. End of the story. And that I saw happen. Um, uh, check your dog. 
in my house. Mm -hmm. Somebody pregnant. I dream about fish. I can't tell you how many times my mother said that. Mm -hmm. All right, folks, I think it's a good stopping point. We'll start at 10. Um, um, just so you know, uh, my my Gmail account, if you want to communicate with me via email between classes, I welcome that. Is jerrygurley at gmail.com, jerrygurley at gmail.com. You want to talk about the session if you have a question that you didn't want to ask among the group. I'm, you gonna check you gonna check your email? I will start for this purpose. <laughs> I was like, I was like, you tried it. Now you might want to tell these people the truth. <laughs> the whole truth, Girl, you might the truth. That you part. Go to email, <laughs> fill it for freedom ministries, and we'll pass it on because he does and not. Well, see, here's the thing. All right. Here's the you thing. You didn't have to put him out there like that. Here's right. the thing. Is, yeah, here's the thing like the Angie. Told me, the the teacher told laugh, me. Like, can can I can I speak? <laughs> can can the teacher speak? <laughs> here's the thing. I don't want to burden you because I know you, ma'am, have a thousand things that you're doing. So I don't uh, want to say send it to Ms. Angie and then she'll get it to me because that's another thing that you have to do. Well, if I you volunteer, I'll make sure I'll make sure he checks it. The class okay, is my witness. Ms. Angie is volunteering. Uh -oh. I'm saying I would no. I'm just saying either you check it, but if you if they send a message, I will. You know, I see you every day now, so I will give give it to you. Or for right. and I will board, also make sure board. he checks his um, all right. Gmail. All right, folks. I, I'm true to my word. I'll stay as long as you want me to say I enjoy this conversation, this interaction. But I, it, we are now one. We are now 17 minutes beyond the time that I said I would. I've ended the lecture, but this conversation is great. I welcome it because that's where the learning and, and the further growth happens in this conversation. So I appreciate, I appreciate it. I my, appreciate my it. Wit. I look forward to talking with you and, and traveling together to this destination. Amen. Let me Amen. let me just finish with a prayer. Father, yes. thank okay. you. Father, thank you. Thank you for the privilege and the honor of serving these great people, of hopefully being a point of inspiration and and cultivation and motivation to these that you love. These that the world have said time and again, you are forgotten, you're inadequate, you're less than. These you love. These that you had a plan for before the foundations of the world were laid. Father, I thank you that your word is going to come forward with clarity and certainty. I thank you that no weapon formed against us is going to prosper. I thank you that the enemies, of, the plans of the enemies will be cast to the ground and defeated. Bless now these your children and inspire them and encourage them and bring us back together again at your appointed time. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Be, Amen. Be blessed. Amen. Amen. Be blessed. Chill. I'm going to stop sharing. Five teachers, Pat. That's Phyllis, by the way. That's Brooke. Oh. Mm -mm, that's Brooke. Brooke is teacher's child. Phyllis is no, teacher's pet. She knows the answers already. She know him however she know him. I don't know. I want to see some more white people on this thing. Bring them, brother. <laughs> Invite some of your neighbors. I got a couple of friends I want to... My so neighbors. This, that are this is a conversation for whoever wants to get in it and learn. Um, but I'm I'm going to be obedient. You know, God has in, instructed me to do what I need to do in terms of inspiring us, because we need to inspire ourselves. Amen. Yes, we, we need do. to work on yeah. healing ourselves, and, yeah, and we keep looking out and not looking in. And look, if our families aren't strengthened, if we don't work to build our own houses. Ain't no law, no governor, no elected official, no nothing. If we don't come up with a group plan, a family plan, a brown plan, a girly plan. Um, can I just say something? Sure. Can you hear me? I, yes, I just like to, like to say that um, classes like these, information being presented like this, and me being 
your twin. I know I'm always out in the zone. I just don't look for information like this. Okay. It doesn't occur to me to go look for information like this. But when it's presented to me, it opens my eyes and say, hey, 